Welcome to Voices of CX Season 8. As usual, bringing you the very best thought leaders, practitioners, and academics all in one place. Our goal is to make your job easier by providing you with the tools and inspiration that you need to lead through empathy, one new idea at a time. Listeners and viewers, welcome to Season 8 of Voices of Customer Experience. Sometimes I can't even believe that we've done eight seasons. So when I say it, it's weird for me, Season 8. We are kicking off Season 8 today with a really cool guest. He is an author and a customer success leader, chief customer officer for many companies. I am not going to do all the talking. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Wayne McCulloch. Go ahead. Give us your history. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Mary. Um, Never been introduced as a cool guest before, so I feel (laughs) feel like there's an element of pressure being added on now (laughs) all of a sudden. Uh, Look, thank thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I think this is a really cool podcast. What's interesting is you say it's like eight, season eight, everything's about eight, and I'm like, well, I, I wrote this book called The Seven Pillars of Customer Success, but in the book... Mm. there's a secret eighth pillar it literally is a it's called bonus track and it's pillar number eight um anyway so i i feel like we're connecting there already i'm so intuitive (laughs) like that look at this (laughs) this is amazing i had to wait eight eight seasons to be able to get on this (laughs) podcast to do it but anyway um so my background is uh pretty much been in b2b software companies my entire career uh started off in the world of education and training, certification, adoption at a company called PeopleSoft back in the 90s when it was a lot smaller than what it ended up being. Um, what I didn't realize at the time is that training and teaching and getting adoption of software is kind of like the perfect introduction into the world of customer success. And customer success is really critical to ensuring that the customer experience is optimized. And so I felt like even though I didn't plan it, even though I'm not that smart, I, I, I've sort of followed this trajectory that's allowed me to evolve and grow and learn in what is feels like to me the single profession, even though they've been in different sort of called different things, been in different parts of the organization over the last couple of decades, but has now culminated in this real um, profession around the customer experience and making sure that the that we're building organizations around the customer and not around ourselves. And so for me, whether it's working at, at PeopleSoft or HP, which taught me how to you know run a a business at scale with you know people in 112 countries around the world on my team, whether it was Salesforce, where I was learning how to run a business at you know incredible scale and growth um, in the SaaS world and the truly like the first real SaaS company, like yeah. and learning learning the, the my chops there, like and then going into a company like Google, which just has incredible massive scale from a user perspective. Um, one of the products that my team leads has over 2 billion users. There's not many people in the world no. can say that their customer success or is sort of thinking about how to create an experience for 2 billion people all at yeah. once. So, so at every stage of the journey, I'm, I've learned new skills. I picked up and, and made lots of mistakes, which we don't need to talk about in this <laughs> session or ever for that matter. Um, but I've learned a lot from thought leaders, from great mentors, coaches, managers, and then myself just practically you know, doing these things. And it sort of culminated in me wanting to write a book to, to share that with people, the seven pillars of customer success. But at the end of the day, um, I'm not the smartest person on the topic, but I do have incredible amounts of experience. And I'm really happy to share some of that with uh, your listeners today. You ruined like three of my follow-up questions right there because um, you really gave the answers that I was looking for <laughs> just straight out the door. But when it, when it came to writing a book, this book, Seven Pillars of Customer Success, you were motivated by all this vast experience that you had. And did you feel like you accomplished what you set out to do when you wrote the book? Were you able to get those ideas out there? Was it enough? Was one book enough? Are you mm-hmm. planning on writing more? Uh, yep. Do you feel like you help, have more to share still? Yeah. So look, writing a book is really hard. So I have so mm-hmm. much more respect for those people that have done it. Um, I began writing my book, took a it was three years to get the book done. And the first 18 months was midnight to 2 a.m. Friday to Saturday. And all I was doing was just putting my thoughts down and trying to trying to understand. Because the whole reason of writing the book really was I didn't feel like I was being the best leader I could be 
for our customers. I felt like I took great best practices from Salesforce and then it didn't work in my next company. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. I'm doing the playbook. It's, this is how you're meant to do it. This is what the webinar said. This is what the person told me to do. Like I'm following all these steps and it wasn't resonating. And so um, I, I tried to put all my thoughts down and try to work it out. And it very after about 18 months, I realized what's missing was a framework on how to do customer success. There's great information on why SaaS is a cool business model, why customers buy differently and subscriptions and tons of content there. And then there's lots of content on how to be a great customer service leader, or how to be a great support agent, how to be an amazing customer success manager, lots of material there. But in the middle, there's a gap from this is really important to this is how we do day-to-day stuff. And that that strategic framework that holds it all together was missing. And that's what the seven pillars became. And it was funny, you mentioned, did I get it all down? So I remember I got to page, the book's 350 pages long, which for a business Mm. book apparently is longer than it should be. Mm. Not a lot of people can read a 350 page business book, but my publisher was like, stop. Like we just got to publish it. Like you can't, you can't have a 500 page book because there's chapters I haven't written yet that I would love to write. So absolutely there's more to be told, but more importantly, this is evolving this field all the time as technology evolves, as people's consumption of technology and expectations of how we communicate, how we serve them changes. The book itself, some of the content is timeless and evergreen, and some of the content actually needs to be refreshed pretty regularly because the ability, the capabilities of how we can communicate and connect with customers changes constantly, which creates opportunity for innovative ways to um, be more personal to do, you know, personalized journeys at scale when it comes to um, experience. So maybe there's another book inside of me. Definitely needs to be a two two or a second edition released. Um, and did I accomplish what I wanted to? I think I did because I get so many e- emails, um, DMs on LinkedIn, just random people post stuff on LinkedIn, which is really it's 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 surprising, right? I'm like, yeah. I don't know this person. And they're in a pool with a picture of my book, snapping a picture with their feet in the pool. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not sure that's the image I want to like, hey, if you're like chilling out in the pool, read this book. I don't know if that gels or not, but these people would post up saying, this is really cool. I'm learning so much or I'm implementing this at work. And, and for me, I'm like, if I can help a group of people, just like I was helped by other mentors, thought leaders to help elevate my career, my knowledge, um, then I've achieved success. And personally for me, I, I think I've done that. And thousands and thousands of books later, sold in 13 countries i've just been approached for the foreign language rights because apparently i'm really big in countries that don't speak a lot of english and they want it in their local language i'm like let's do it like if i can spread this as far and wide around the planet i will and that to me is um that's that's a success for me so that's awesome well let me ask you something you built your career in the field of technology and i think that the one thing that you mentioned a couple minutes ago, which I think can absolutely apply to the line of business that you're in, is how do you update? How do you constantly update? And the need to continuously update your processes is so much more intense when you're working in a field like technology because what you're part of that innovation. You're part of the engine that's bringing new things to the market that's therefore reshaping customers' expectations at every turn. So when you're when you're part of the change, keeping up with the change is so much faster. Yeah. And you're surrounded by competitors and other organizations that are racing after innovation faster and faster than ever. So what it, what do you think is the best way to keep up with customers' expectations? In your case, in the B2B space, it's the expectations of corporations as to what technology is going to provide with tools and with platforms to attend their customers better. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you're asking the easy questions first, uh, Mary. <laughs> um, look, <laughs> for me, the, the most important thing is we have to always... And, and this is weird because I'm a customer success leader. I'm someone who cares pretty much about the customer day in and day out. That's, I wake up thinking, how can I create a better experience? How can I go drive that? But it's easy to get distracted 
by all the technology and all the advancements, right? And the really key part is you've got to keep your eye on the customer. Like, what is the customer telling you? What does the customer need? Like, because there's so many things where I'm like, oh, that looks like really cool technology. Let's go play with that and see if we can get that into our business. And how, and, and I'm like, oh, no, hang on, stop. Just because it's cool and it looks good doesn't mean it's the right thing. What does the customer need? What do we need to provide? And allow that to guide where we should be focusing. That's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is with technology, um, you're right. One of the challenges is some of the technology coming out requires you to think very differently about mm-hmm. how you've done things in the past. And this is the hardest part for me as a success leader. I know this works. So when something comes along and it's like, well, I actually have to do it a different way in order to take advantage of this, that's a really hard shift because yeah. that's risk. Yeah, personally, for me, I'm like, well, if I make a mistake, then that's my career on the line. It's my team's performance on the line. And ultimately, the customer's experience is on the line. Um, but it's to be very open, to be very fluid, knowing that the environment we're in is constantly changing, constant innovation, constantly giving us opportunities to improve. And we should be very vigilant about making sure we're keeping on top of that, not resting on our laurels, not just staying safe. We need to try new technology. And we need to understand how it solves the customer's challenge that they have at that point in time. Um, I do think also there's shifts in how we think about um, technology and the user. So forever and a day, we as individuals have had to fit the technology. Like if you're using an application, then the application is built and you have to use the application the way it's designed. And then the complexity in customizing and maintaining and it's just you know but what we need to be thinking about is using technology that fits the way we work and i think that shift is happening in the marketplace there's products coming out now you know like a, a walk me for example where they say let's let the product fit what the user is doing let's use intelligence whether it's ai or whether it's contextual, let's use machine learning. Let's use technology to start making the software much more uh, incredibly intelligent around how to behave for the user, as opposed to trying to shape and change a behavior of a user. Because we got to remember, in this day and age, we use lots of applications, not just yeah. one. It's rare I sit in one application all day. Mm-mm. I might sit in my mailbox, might be open all day, but I don't use it all day. I'm using lots of products. And if I have to change the way I behave in every product, think of it as a user. They're using lots of different products, websites, you know, support, help desk, whatever it is. You're asking them to adapt to however that system works. And that that's an old way of thinking. We have to start thinking about software adapting to the people so mm-hmm. that they can have a very consistent experience. That's super hard to do. So yeah. Hopefully that answers your question, Mary. I don't know. Do you think that the way that technology develops new products and new services in general, do you think there's still room for uh, product, product-centered product companies? And I mean, I, I know that the the go-to answer is no, we have to be customer-centric about the way that we develop our applications and our features and our products. But is there still something to be said for the revolutionary individual who creates a product or a service that the market didn't realize they needed? And, you know, I'm probably going back to that whole Steve Jobs things about not asking customers what they want because they don't know what they want. Or the the Henry Ford thing of if you ask customers what they wanted, they'd say a faster horse, right? Right. So is there still something to be said for innovation that happens without directly consulting or catering to customers' needs? So I believe the answer is 100% yes. Like okay. there's not even a, a, it's a weird question to ask me because I'm like, well, that's weird. <laughs> why would you ask that? Because of course, that is, that is, to me, that's the innovation part. When we start talking about what a customer's need, and we that's an evolution of what we have. The big steps happen when someone's ahead of the market, is someone thinking of the future. Take Lloyd Tab, the founder of Looker, right? He created a data platform company that was dependent on cloud databases being the dominant way data was used, and that allowed him to design a platform totally different to how business analytics was done you know, in the old school way with these old tools. 
And that was seven years before cloud databases really took off. But when it did, Looker was right there. Lloyd had that vision and understood that, you know, using the the old school tools of, you know, Power BI or Tableau or really old like Cognos and all those stuff, like that doesn't work in today's technology um, environment, but Looker does. And so tremendous growth and amazing customer experiences were had because he did that thinking. And he he still today had one of the, I have two favorite quotes in the world. One is from Lloyd Tab, which was great software is an act of empathy. To me, that is like, like you are building software that is to help people be successful. So when you don't do that, if there's a bug, if there's a problem, if there's an issue, if the UI, the UX, if the output, if the time it takes, if all these things are not great, you are impacting that customer's ability, that person, that individual to be successful in their job. Like if you think of it that way, you're like, whoa, that's a lot of pressure. Someone's career, like whether they go home at night and see their kids before bed is if they can, the software is working or if it stops and they have to do a ticket and then they're on calls and they're stuck at work at night, you're impacting an individual's life, right? So he, he sort of stated this really elegant phrase, which I'm like, oh, everything we should do should be an act of empathy, right? Because yeah. especially in software. Yeah. Um, so having people like, Lloyd Tab think dream of the future and 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 predict what that's going to look like with the uncanny certainties. We need more of those people, but it doesn't mean we don't still evolve what we have while we're waiting for that to make sure the customer experience is constantly being tweaked and improved. Yeah. Well, speaking of empathetic technologies, um, is do you believe that it's in a very near future where technology itself can be empathetic? Um, or do you think that regardless of what's developed and uh, the advancements of AI and machine learning, et cetera, we will still always have that dependence on the human element? Yeah, so I, I do think technology is getting closer mm -hmm. to being empathetic. But I, I I'll, I'll be careful here. I don't, I'm don't. i not confident that it will be completely empathetic. And in fact, I don't actually want it or need it to be empathetic. What I want it to be able to do is take a person's empathy and scale that out rather than try to scale it out through technology. I um, There's a, a formula that myself and two other friends that I'm um, writing another book about right now um, we have, which is AI plus HI equals great customer experience. And that's artificial intelligence plus human intelligence is actually how you get to the ultimate customer experience. Just AI or just HI does not get you all the way there because they both bring to the table the, the plugging the gaps that the other doesn't have. Now, we can, we can be really smart and clever and build technology that emulates a human and do all that stuff. That's great. But at the end of the day, actually talking with a person, having a human connection, that is special. That is really unique. And we don't, there's no need to replace that. If the need to replace it is a business metric or operational metric, it's nothing to do with the customer. The customer enjoys that. Not every customer does for every interaction, but when it really counts, having a person to talk to, like if COVID taught us anything, it taught us that people connecting with people is amazingly powerful for a human being. And when you don't get that, bad things happen. And so if we can get technology to work out how to make that happen more, I think we have a winning solution. Yeah. The company that I work at, Worthix, that's exactly what we do, right? We work on the whole idea of scaling empathy, right? And providing decision makers with tools to be empathetic with their customers. So, and and I, like like you said, I think that to a certain degree, that may be enough, at least for this moment in the market. I don't yep. know where customer expectations are going to head, you know, 10 years from now. But at this moment, I believe that delivering to executives, to decision makers, the ability to connect with their customers on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis at scale, yep. that's enough to deliver really, really deep insight as to what the pains, the needs, the expectations, um, the, the success means to customers, right? Now, Absolutely. do you do you think that the that companies out there in general, 
and I'm not talking about Silicon Valley companies or tech companies that tend to be pretty ahead of the game when it comes to adopting technologies, becoming early adopters of technology. I'm I'm speaking of the rest of the companies in the world, which, you know, is, I don't know, 80% of organizations out there. Do you think they're ready to adopt this kind of technology? Do you think they're ready to start empathizing with their customers on a more um, one-on-one basis or what's missing for this to happen? Yeah. Well, I think that's there's multiple components to the answer here. The first one is there's always a group of custom um, of companies mm-hmm. and companies are just people. So there's a yeah. group of companies or people in those companies that don't get it. They just don't. They don't get it because they haven't been exposed to it. They don't get it because it's, you know, it's not something they're open to or, or, or looking for. And so they will always struggle. And the good news is that that group of companies shrinks every day as other companies get it. It puts pressure on these companies that don't. And those companies typically either go out of business or have to, you know, step up and, and jump in the game. And so that's, that's one component. There's another component, which I really believe is they, they understand the need for it. They don't know how to go do it. So I would equate that to you've got a leader who's a visionary and they, they, they know what everything all fits together. They are very articulate, they're charismatic, everyone's excited, but they have no idea how to implement it. And what, what I found is it's actually a different skill set. So you've got to marry someone's vision and understanding with people that actually can go out and find the right technology, deploy it correctly and leverage it in a way that realizes the vision and that takes multiple people. And then, of course, there's the companies that really just get it and they, they're on it and they're probably customers of yours. And they just, they're like, oh, we know what we need to go do. Help us go do it. They'll do it. And then suddenly they're really successful. Um, but I think your point is accurate that you said earlier, which is for now, like we've got to take these, these steps forward. We can't wait for the next leap. It's coming, but it could be five years, 10 years, 10, next week. We don't know. But taking that next step. And like you said, if we can scale those one-to-one interactions using technology and using humans, I think that keeps propelling us forward. It keeps moving us in the right direction uh, for a customer. Um, so I, I, I do think that there's an opportunity here. You know, you've got to educate people on what this empathy thing is all about. I'll, I'll tell you at, at Looker, for example, when we're hiring in, say, the customer support organization, mm-hmm. which we call DCL, Department of Customer Love, so, which when I joined, I got I to gotta be honest. You were like, yeah. uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I told my wife and she tells me, I don't remember doing this, so I'm not going to say I did this. But she remembers me sort of rolling my eyes and saying, department, <laughs> customer love, whatever. Like, because every company markets, you know, we're customer centric. And then you sure. just look at how they operate and you're like, you're not customer centric at all. But they say it, it's on their logo, it's on their wall, it's on their website, but they're not. But I really, it was customer love. Like these people genuinely love the customer. And it wasn't until I understood that the way they hired those people is they hired for empathy. That mm-hmm. was the test. Hmm. That was not, it's not like, do you know data analytics? Can you code SQL? Can you, like all those questions you would ask of a support analyst supporting people who have these typically technical questions. Well, we believe we can teach that technical stuff, but we can't teach empathy. And so hire people with empathy, we can develop that further um, because we have a great base of someone who's empathetic. So the same goes with the software. If we can find software that can take these empathetic people that really genuinely want to help, that's that's their main motivation of work is to help people be successful. That's gold. So huh. let's do that. <laughs> that's interesting. I, I've, got, I've got a theory about empathetic people. And I came up with this the other day and I was like, whoa, I think I really got something here because I, I realized that empathy walks hand in hand with someone's creative ability or their ability to create an imaginary scenario. Because when you're able to imagine what it's like to be in the other person's shoes, then you yep. can empathize with them, which which means that maybe people that haven't really developed their creative side, they may be less empathetic. What do you think? This is literally me thinking out loud the other day. Yeah. Well, um, look, <laughs> I, I don't want to give away when my trade secrets here, but so when I come into a new organization and as a customer, sort of when you think about a chief customer officer, you're typically across 
support, customer success, services, training, community, like anything that's really touching the customer. You have lots of different people. And what I've discovered is when you get frustrations and when things aren't working really well, it's because each team doesn't fully understand the challenges the other team has. Why does support take a whole day to respond? Like it's an easy answer, just respond, you know, but that's not a person's fault. That's a process. It could be technology. It could be, there's so many other things, right, that that get in the way. And so one of the things I always do is I bring these teams physically together. I will give up my hiring, you know, 10, 20, 30% of my hiring budget for the year to go fund the ability to bring in potentially hundreds of people from all over the world to spend a week together with the specific intent of developing empathy for each other. Because once you've created empathy for someone else, someone else's role, someone else's job, you're not quick to judge. You're not quick to get frustrated. You're actually very motivated to work within the bounds and constraints everyone has to find success, which translates amazingly well to a customer because a customer gets stuck and someone's like, oh yeah, I'll take that. Um, support, can you help? I didn't hear from them. And it, what's going on? Like, so services, you want to charge for everything? Blah, blah, blah. Like, and someone gets real frustrated because they don't understand these the, the situation these other teams are in. And once you create that empathy internally, you then come up with the creative solution. You then start to understand, well, if we have these restrictions, what if we did this and this and this? What if we automated that? What if we bypassed that and did this? Like, And the team themselves develops the unique creative sort of solution to help a customer. Same goes for customers. Like when we're dealing with customers, they're in a very specific situation. They're in a difficult situation. We don't necessarily understand what they're going through, what the challenges are. What we need to do is go solve their problem. And so um, that's something I do internally when it comes to empathy and understanding empathy from each, like other people's situation, putting yourself in their shoes, so to speak, like you said. And then overlaying that with the creativity around how do we, with all of these restrictions, how do we prevail? How do we create something that the customer needs for them to be successful? Mm -hmm. I think we need, we need more of that. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's, let's go a level deeper. If companies are just people, like you said, Mm -hmm. and empathy is the one thing that's going to give us the tools we need to provide our customers with success. Then how is it that we empathize with companies? (laughs) Okay. Well, companies equals people. So we're still empathizing Mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. But it's a collective, right? It's a collective of people that has unique goals and you may even be dealing directly with an individual but how likely is that individual to be truly reflecting the needs and the pains of the organization that you're serving as a whole? Well, let's look at this from two angles. The first one is inside your own organization as far as how it projects empathy to customers. And then let's think about how we empathize with a, a, a company, an entire corporation's mission, which is different to an individual or a person, right? So in the first example, I often talk about, we talk about customer success as a department, but it's not, it's a philosophy that just happens to be a department named customer success, but you don't need to name a department customer success to be a customer success company, right? So the example I often give is, um, you know, my the finance team in my particular company, they, may not, they might not be full of empathetic people. Like they weren't hired for empathy, they were hired for their financial acumen and all these other things, and they're not customer facing. So, you know, that's okay. Not everyone has to be empathetic, but the action of the company needs to be empathetic. So how do we do that? Well, I've got a customer success org full of very empathetic customer success managers, and I've got a finance team, very adept at financial capabilities that my CSMs will never understand, right? But one of the the tasks of the finance team, the accounting group, is to go send a renewal sort of heads up to a customer, and it says, hey, your renewal's coming up in 30 days. Here's the details of the renewal. Is the sort of, you know, if you pay now, you pay up front, you get a discount. If you pay late, you're going to get a penalty. And there's all these terms and conditions. And basically, is, that's the note. And it's automatically generated. And, well, that's not very empathetic. That's kind of a crappy experience, if you ask me. <laughs> it's like, why, why wouldn't we think about how does that process, how do we be more empathetic? And so just simply creating maybe an HTML version of an email that sort of celebrates, maybe there's a GIF or some sort of, you know, moving emoji or something. It's kind of like, hey, celebrate. We're about to renew our partnership. We're so excited. We've been partnering for seven years together on this journey. 
the last 12 months, we saw some tremendous wins together with an, an insert seven, you know, successful project launches, releases, updates. They spoke at a conference, released a blog, like whatever, whatever the advocacy assets are, put that in the note and then just say, um, and, you know, to find out more about the terms and conditions, click here and take them to a generic site that they can go to, but keep it out of the note, keep the note very excited, keep it very positive, keep it focused on the value. And because the person you're talking to in that company, they may or may not have any influence at all, but I can tell you when things are tough, like when COVID came along and they're like, well, which bills do we pay? Which products do we keep? The company that celebrates and talks about the wins and showcases and demonstrates value will always outshine the companies that send the generic corporate note. They're like, you know what? I have time for that. Like this company is making an effort. You're not. I need to partner with people that want to help. And so, this, so that's an example of inside our company, we might not have empathetic people everywhere, but we can have empathetic processes that can scale out that empathy, if you will. So that's one. The second one is like, then how do we be empathetic to a company and help them achieve their goals? And I think COVID really taught us that that bought, that showed you which companies oozed empathy for others. I remember at Looker, one of the first things we did was we said, okay, this big hit is coming. We sat down with finance. We sat down with legal and we're like, we need to be proactive. This is in March of last year. We're like, we need to be proactive in going to customers and we need to help the frontline people talking to these customers, we need to arm them with the authority to make decisions like suspending renewals, th- you know, you know, up, um, extending contract, like things we wouldn't normally allow the field to do. We need to do that. Now we need governance around it. We need, but, but we need to do it because we have thousands of customers at exactly the same time going through the exact same pain. So how do we, enable our organization which typically can handle one or two of these conversations that take weeks of legal and going backwards how do we avoid the process challenge that everyone is going to face and be very nimble and create a way to and and you know what we did it and we were able to help customers go months and months and months and months and months without even paying because they're laying off people and staff and and you know what things are coming back and now they're paying and a lot of them are back paying. Like they're saying as, as revenues are coming in, we're, we're oblig- you know, you were there for us, we're going to be there for you. And we have this amazing partnerships that's now formed our, our logo retention, our GRR, our NRR, all scaling up um, tremendously because we acted really quickly about like, let's put ourselves in the shoes of our customer. They're under tremendous stress and pain. The first reaction is how are we going to protect ourselves? Customers are not going to pay anymore. Like that's our first natural reaction as a company. but and that's, by the way, that's the right reaction to have as a company. You don't want to go out of business and then the customers have no one. But but the way it manifested itself was how do we help our customers? Not you have to pay or we're going to cut you off because we can't afford to. No, we have to think creatively. Um, one of my bosses that I've had in the past, he always used to quote Jim Collins, uh, good to great, it's like the genius of the and and the tyranny of the or. We have to find a way to preserve our company and our customers. It's easy to do one or the other. It's really hard to do both. And that's where that's where empathy helps because empathy helps you to do the hard stuff. Mm-hmm. My last question for you today, Wayne, is, I mean, this this all sounds great. It sounds amazing. Now, you have been in a really unique position over the years where you've worked at organizations that cater to hundreds, thousands, millions of B2B companies. And that's that's really interesting. That's a really unique place to be. Like you said, there not everyone out there can say, hey, I lead customer success for 2 billion customers. So how do you scale this? Well, isn't that why we use your software? <laughs> Is that a leading question? Or? <laughs> well, well, it wasn't. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no I don't no. have to make the shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but, I, but I think it's an important question, right? Because and, and I, it comes back to the AI plus HI equation. We have to find a way to leverage technology with people to drive that desired outcome for a customer. And it's really hard to do. It's hard to admit. It's hard to like discover how to go do that for the unique situations. As I said, you know, Google, for example, 
when I was running customer success across the workspace organization, there are two point whatever billion users of workspace. That's that's a scale that is blows people's minds when you think about it. You know, now not all of them are paying customers, but they're all future potential paying customers. And so, you know, thinking about how do we create an experience all the way down to, you know, to the paying customers and then the corporations and all of that. In my mind, it's it's really the only way to successfully do it is to find a way for technology to amplify, to scale the very limited resources you will always have as a company. And I, if, if you're listening to this and you're a 10 person, 100 person, 1,000 person, 100,000 person company, it doesn't matter. You don't have enough people. I can already tell you, you don't have enough people to provide the experience you would love to give if you're in my, if you're in my role. You just never have enough people and you got to be okay with it. That's, we shouldn't rail against it, shouldn't complain about it. We shouldn't worry and freak out about it. What we should be thinking about is, so how do I use technology to take the resources I have and make that work for our customers the way they need us to behave? And so for me, that behavioral change is really difficult to do for some people. And it was for me early in my career. I remember just complaining all day long about I don't have enough people, don't have enough people. What I should have been saying is I'm not I'm not finding a way to scale the people I have, not finding a way to scale the knowledge, the experience, whatever it is. Um, and so that's that's part of my maturation as a leader is understanding that that's, that's okay. You're, you're going to be in that situation pretty much for your whole life. So get used to it. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, Wayne, I'm going to give you a chance to talk a little bit about your book, where people can find it. Um, yeah. And... How, can they reach you? Can they just send you an email if they had questions or like other than tagging you in a picture in the pool with their toes up? Um, how else can they, cool, by the way, I'm okay. With that. <laughs> how yeah. else can they communicate their doubts or even just a compliment? Like you said, is LinkedIn a good way? Yeah, I think there's, um, there's two ways. LinkedIn is I'm, I'm on there. I'm pretty active. I, I like to both respond to people and, and give my, my thoughts to some comments. And I also like mm -hmm. to post some things too. So LinkedIn's a really good way. I also have a website, um, cspillars.com. And if you go there, there's actually a way to speak directly to me through the website as well. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff coming. So as I said, there's more content for the book I'm going to put there. All the, the templates and assets in the book, you can download off the website for free um, if it's going to help you in your business and your company. Um, and then there's also extra stuff coming all the time. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. The one thing I will say, uh, The Seven Pillars is on um, uh, Amazon and mm -hmm. it's available in 13 countries. And there's a Kindle version, a hardcover, a softcover, and audiobook coming Ooh. very soon that's being read by an Australian actor. So it sounds like <laughs> me, but it's not me because I don't have time. But that'll be fun if you like listening to Australians <laughs> reading books to you while you're driving to work. I don't know who does that, but if you do, then that's for you. So yeah, lots of ways. In my mind, I imagine going onto your website and there's seven tabs. And as you click on it, there are seven options that open up with seven <laughs> resources to download. <laughs> yeah. Everything just seven. <laughs> I need to head to Vegas. I need to head all on seven. Um, or eight. Or do I do eight? Because it's eight. It's really eight. It, it should be eight. It, it really should be eight. Be eight. <laughs> yeah. Wayne, thank you so much for coming on and joining us today. It's been really exciting to speak to you. And um, everything that you've said is, I mean, it, we're so like-minded in that sense of, of looking at empathy and the importance of it and how to scale it using technology. So it was great having you on. And I encourage our listeners and our viewers to go out and buy Wayne's book, The Seven Pillars of Customer Success, and connect with him, tag him on pictures, and then let us know what you thought of his book. We'll be happy to hear about it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Mary. And thanks so much for having me here. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I look forward to being here on season nine. There you go. Awesome. Yeah. I'll be sure to extend the invite, but then you have to write a book about the nine pillars of customer success, with oh. <laughs> whichever else you come up with. <laughs> yeah. Let me work on that one. I might need a bit of time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Thank you. Yes. Thanks again. Bye. That's our show. Thanks for joining us. We hope we've brought you one step closer to leading through empathy. It's our way of making the world a better place, one business at a time. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell if you want to know as soon as we publish a new episode. 
Voices of CX is brought to you by Worthix. I'm Mary Drummond. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, edited and co-produced by Steve Barry. See you next week.